Hello and welcome to your damn jets. Um, in this episode, if you're squeamish, you might not want to watch it. Uh, I don't think there's anything particularly um, problematic in it. Uh, you're not going to see blood or operations, but uh, I'm going to talk about that. So if just the idea of an operation makes you uh, squeamish, uh, you probably shouldn't watch it. Um, so in the previous episode, it was the overview of the stem cell transplant. In this episode, I'm going to get into the preparation for the stem cell transplant and what I specifically experienced. And uh, the plan was to get the stem cell transplant as U at UMMC, uh, and they're in the same city as uh, Johns Hopkins. So it was not a big change for me. Uh, but it was better for me because they kept me... Uh, in the hospital for the whole transplant procedure, whereas uh, Johns Hopkins would have had me be there for a week and then have to find housing in Baltimore to be able to go to the clinic every day. So on April 20th, I had my first contact with UMMC. They called me the, to try to, to set up the appointments for the stem cell transplant. My oncologist at Johns Hopkins had... Um, told them that I wanted to get the stem cell transplant there, so they called me. On 26th, April 26, 2021, I had my first visit with Dr. Lee and Dr. Yared. Um, Dr. Lee was a general oncologist assigned to me, and Dr. Yared was a stem cell oncologist. Uh, so you have to realize when you get a stem cell transplant, you have, I think, in most cases, two oncologists assigned to you. Like at Johns Hopkins, I had my Dr. Holdoff, who was my regular oncologist, and then there was another doctor who was the stem cell transplant specialist. And they were both assigned to me. And it's, it's, it was the same thing at UMMC, uh, where Dr. Lee was my general oncologist and Dr. Yared was my uh, stem cell transplant oncologist. And I mentioned before that I'm a big believer in second opinions. I ended up getting four opinions on my stem cell transplant. I had my regular oncologist at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Holdoff. I had the stem cell transplant oncologist there who uh, also agreed with him. I had uh, Dr. Lee uh, at uh, UMMC who agreed I should get a stem cell transplant. And I had Dr. Yared, who is the stem cell transplant specialist, who also agreed. So I had four doctors tell me, you should get the stem cell transplant. Um... I think that's a, a fair amount of, of people agreeing that it's a good solution. Um, but I was not looking for a second opinion. It just happened that way that I had four doctors agreeing that I should get it. Um, and Dr. Yara happened to have been educated in France. I saw him speaks French and he was speaking French to me sometimes. Not always, um, but he spoke to me a few times in French. Um for one thing, my wife was there and she doesn't speak French, so it would have been problematic to just uh, have conversation in French. Um, and then, um, also, I forgot to mention, but while I was in the hospital, for the whole length of my treatment, when I was at Johns Hopkins and I was in chemo, I had uh, nurses and doctors sometimes who came in and spoke French to me. All right, I recall... Uh, one nurse in particular who was working the night shift, unfortunately, <laughs> and then was waking me up in the middle of the night and was speaking to me in French. I don't know how coherent I was, uh, but it has happened uh, a few times that the staff there was speaking French. On May 3rd, I saw a neurologist, and in my situation, what they were worried about is to see whether they would have to change the dosage of Kepra, which was keeping the seizures at bay. And we decided at that time, based on what I told the doctor and what the doctor heard in his examination, that we didn't need to change the dosage. So we left it exactly as it was. On May 6th, 2021, I had an MRI at UMMC. Um, and I guess it was for them to you know, do their homework and double check that Johns Hopkins did not miss something. Uh, during that MRI, I, when I have an MRI and there's music, I usually tell them what I want to hear. And usually it's uh, Siri Nelson or, or Melissa Horn. And Siri Nelson is a Norwegian singer, so she sings in Norwegian. And Melissa Horn is a Swedish singer, so she, she sings in Swedish. And that time I asked for Melissa Horn, and after the MRI was done, the tech 
came back and he said, did I get the right person <laughs> on the speakers? Because I, I think he was surprised that like he started that and Swedish came out and it's like, did I get it wrong? No, he, I reassured him that he got it right. So the, the, the MRI was clean on May 8th. Um, I went to the DMV to get my license back because I forgot to mention that, but throughout my uh, chemo, at some point I had to be wheeled here and there and I had to manage the cards that I had on me because I didn't want to be at the hospital without anything at all. Unfortunately, I guess if you don't have the pandemic, you can always leave your cards with your wife and then she comes and she can give the cards to whoever, but she wasn't there. So I had to have everything on me. And at some point, my driver's license was in the pocket of one of the gowns and that gown went to laundry and my driver's license disappeared. Um, presumably it was destroyed by the washing machine. And then, uh, so I went on the 8th to get it, to get a new uh, driver's license. In the meantime, I didn't need a driver's license because my vision was so, was messed up and the, the chemo also was kind of, you know, messing with my energy and stuff like that. I didn't want to drive. My wife drove me around for the whole time. Uh, May 30th, um... This is the first time I had my shot of PCSK9 inhibitor. I had been approved for it in the fall before, but we had decided to put it aside while I was having chemo so that I wouldn't have one more thing to track. But I was keen to get on it to see how it would work for me. And on May 3rd, 13th, I had my first shot of the inhibitor and I continued taking it throughout my stem cell transplant and so I'm still taking it right now and it, it made the, all the difference between having a doctor saying well your cholesterol is okay considering that you have familial hypercholesterolemia and versus a doctor saying your cholesterol is perfect for a normal person right now I'm at normal levels uh, so this is great um, May 17th I had a pulmonary function test. I had to breathe into a tube and then somebody was analyzing the, the results. I had an echocardiogram. I think I also had an electrocardiogram, but I have those fairly often, so it was a bit of a blur for me. Um, I also did a nurse visit that day and she instructed about in, um, injecting myself um, with the... The products to push the stem cells out of my body. Uh, on May 20th, I had a social worker meeting. I didn't need the social worker very much. The one thing that they did for me uh, was when I was at UMMC, I, I there was a lot of um, of delay in me getting my affairs in order. I already had a will. I already had all the documents, but my will was way out of date. It was still mentioning my mother, who's dead. Um, so I, I got the social workers when I was in the hospital at UMC to to witness what they needed to witness, get the signatures in order, and I got all my documents in order. So on the twentieth, I was it was just the first meeting, and the the person who told me what they were doing, what they could do for me, and I didn't need them much. The, the only thing I needed them for was the getting the documents in order. On May twenty fourth, I had. Um, CAT scan with and without contrast. Again, that's preparation for the stem cell transplant. They want to make sure that I'm not going to die <laughs> while they're doing it. Um, I also had a lab. Lab at that point becomes pretty much routine that you need to have your blood checked from time to time. Um, I also had a nurse visit where I got a container for a 24-hour urine test and I had already done one before. Uh, when they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me, I had a copper test. Um, and the first time I did the copper test, I had prednisone in my system. So I was getting off prednisone, so I was peeing like hell. I The first attempt, I maxed out the container and I, I that was it. I, had, I needed to pee more and the container was full. So I had to redo it. Um, but for uh, on May 24th, when they gave me the other container, I had already experienced and I knew that I would be fine because I was not on steroids anymore. 
On May 26th, I had the transplant class. You have a class when you get a stem cell transplant at the beginning, before before the transplant, to explain to you the process, who's going to be involved, the schedule, what you need to do, injections, what operations you're going to have because they put, need to put it in a Hickman line and then they need to take it out eventually. Um, so on the 26th, I had a transplant class. I got to the hospital to return the container of 24-hour uh, urine. Um, and I got instructions on how to care for the Hickman line because when it's in you, you have to flush the ports. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, later what it looks like. On May uh, 30th, I got the first shot of uh, Nivestim and I gave it to to myself. I, 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 I did it by myself. It was not at the hospital. It was at home. I had received the, the, the drug and the Nivestim is something that pushes, uh, well, it produces more stem cells and it pushes them out of the bone marrow. So I, I got my first shot on May 30th. On June 1st, I, got, I, I had to go to the hospital to get a COVID test done. And while I was there, um, I was having chest pain and I was uh, worried because I have a cardiac history. You know, I had a heart attack at 24. And um, the other thing is that sometimes the drug they gave me can cause aortitis, which is an inflammation of the aorta. Uh, so I told them that and they say, go to the ER. We, you know, there's nothing we can do in the office here. You need to go to the ER for them to look you up. So I went to the ER. Uh, they did a checkup. They looked all the heart enzymes and everything that would indicate whether the heart or something around it is being damaged and they found nothing and we well now we're pretty sure but at that time they were they were hypothesizing that there was probably in that small portion of people who do get bone pain in the chest so i did get bone pain from the nivestim injection and they told me that that would get bone probably get bone pain but a lot of people don't have it in the chest, but I did have my pain in the bone right here, which to me felt a lot like my heart is in distress, even though I didn't have any other symptoms. Uh, so they checked me out and they they said, you know, it's probably the drug that is doing that to you. And I think they were right. Um, on June 2nd, I had the Hickman installed and that's a surgery. So I had to go to the hospital to get it installed and let me show you what the Hickman looks like that that's it that's what it looks like I'm gonna switch my screen um, that's what it looks like where you have the bandage here um, that's where it goes into into the skin um, and it stays there for a while so for a while you have this thing coming out of your skin and it doesn't hurt I mean it hurts when they they put it in it, it does hurt somewhat but you can take medicine for it if if you're not allergic to those medicines. So I didn't have a big problem with the pain. Uh, so they, they make a hole uh, at the bottom, then they make a hole at the top where you have the other gauze uh, because they have to turn the, the thing around and, um, you know, it's not magic. So, so they have to make a hole there. And then you have two lines coming out, uh, a blue and a red line. And I... To be frank, I don't remember uh, which is which, but it's for, it's for blood flow in, in two different directions. And this one, I think, has a lanyard to uh, to kind of keep it up. Uh, I didn't have that. I didn't need it actually. I you know I didn't feel that anything was missing, but I guess it's some people probably like it. Uh, and uh, it's clamp shut, uh, so you can see the clamps are clamp shut. Um, and so yeah, this thing you have to flush it every day. So they they showed me how to do it uh, and how to do it so that I wouldn't be spewing uh, blood all over the place. Uh, and it was not complicated, you know. You just put the the syringe at, at, in, at the opening of the of the Hickman line, and you open the clamp and you push it, and then you close the clamp and you remove the syringe. It was not very difficult. I'm probably missing. I'm now maybe missing some steps here, but. And I'm just giving you an overview of how, how it was. So, yeah, on that day I had the Hickman installed. I also had a, a Mosobil injection that I, I... You have to get it at the hospital. And I was warned that it may cause um, 
explosive diarrhea. <laughs> uh, so I had a diaper already on me uh, that I was we wearing because I didn't want to to. And they say you know there, there can be a delay, so you can be on the way back home and then you start spewing diarrhea in the car. I didn't want to be unprotected, so as a precaution, I put the diaper beforehand, and the, the nurse agreed that it was sensible. Uh, but I was lucky, but it didn't happen. You know, sometimes the side effects don't happen uh, if you're lucky, and I was lucky it didn't, didn't happen. Um, on June 3rd and the 4th, um, they were set aside for blood filtering. Um, so let me go back. Here's, yeah, the, the, I, had a, I was in the hospital on a bed like this, like this guy. Uh, and there was an apheresis ma machine right next to me. And what it does is it filters uh, the stem cells out of the blood. And um, yeah, it was very similar to this machine. I, I mean, as far as I know, it could have been even the same brand, but I'm not sure. It took the morning to filter my blood from 7 to maybe noon or something like that. And they were able to get um, three times the amount of cells that they needed and I didn't have to come back uh, the next day um, so I was happy about that uh, because I had set aside two days and it just needed one day um, and then on June 7th uh, I had lab work done uh, because again the lab work it becomes uh, very frequent when you have a stem cell transplant and then a follow-up with Dr. Yared on the 14th, I had more lab work. I had an infusion, but now I don't remember what the infusion was. Um, and then on June 18th, uh, from, from June 18th to July 6th, I, that was a stem cell transplant. I was admitted to the hospital on June 18th, and uh, I was discharged on July 6th. And this is going to be the topic of my next video. So this video is just a preparation for the stem cell transplant. And there's a lot of preparation where they do tests on you to make sure that uh, you're a good candidate in terms of being able to receive the medicine and not dying in the middle of the procedure. Um, and your organs are good. And, if, and sometimes if the organs are not... Uh, optimal they they can adjust things to try to to make it better for you uh, but uh, of course there's always a, a limit eventually I mean some people they just cannot have a stem cell transplant because they're just not in, in a good enough shape uh, to get it and um, for this episode I don't really have a lessons learned you know uh, um, so next episode is going to be the stem cell transplant itself how how it went um, so for now, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, see you next episode.